Yes, Jesus is our living hope, and the Bible says that we are born again unto this living hope. We are alive in Christ, and the body of evidence supports not only the death but the burial and the resurrection of Christ, and we are so thankful that we live in the presence and in the power of Jesus Christ. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 John, and uh, we'll begin with the fifth chapter. There's a tombstone uh, in England somewhere that is inscribed with these words, pause stranger as you pass by, as you now are, once was I. As I now am, so you will be prepared to die and follow me. Someone read that and inscribed on another little sign beneath the tombstone, to follow you I am not content until I know which way you went. (laughs) Do you know where you are going? So many people don't, in life or in death. But God made you on purpose for a purpose, and God has a wonderful plan for your life. And unfortunately, so many people aren't sure about their salvation. I'm speaking of people who are members of churches, some who are attending church, some in this room or watching online right now. You are not absolutely certain of your salvation, but God has given us the Word the clear word of Scripture, in order that we may know that we have eternal life and live with this purpose and with this peace that we know that we're saved and that we're on our way to heaven. Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? I mean, are you totally and completely certain? We need to think more about our mortality. Because one day you will be in eternity and so will I. And as we come to this table of the Lord today, as we receive the Lord's Supper, it's so very vital and essential that you know with divine certitude, with divine certainty, with blessed assurance to say Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, that you are building your life on the sure foundation of Jesus Christ. So once again, I ask you, do you know where you're going? Are you sure that you are saved? Knowing that your sins are forgiven, all of them. Do you know that Christ lives in you by the power of His resurrection? And do you know that you're going to spend eternity with Him. There are so many who can't answer positively to that question. Some are not confident. Some cannot say yes for sure because there may be some sin, some besetting sin, some sinful habit in their lives creating shame and guilt. And so they wonder, am I truly saved? Others have never been taught assurance of salvation and security in Christ. And unfortunately, many are mistaught regarding this subject. Others experience doubt when they go through a crisis. A crisis, a difficulty in our life can give rise to fears and to doubts, even to doubt God and even to doubt our salvation. Many uh, who are saved as children have never developed, grown in their faith so that as adults or as teenagers, you're certain that What you did as a child was real and that is forever. And if you live doubting, doubting your salvation, wondering about this, then certainly you're going to struggle in your prayer life. You're going to have difficulty sharing your faith with others because how can you share a faith you're not sure of yourself? We want to live in the vitality and in the vigor and the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Not wondering, not failing, not flailing in life. I'm calling this message a no-so salvation. A no-so salvation. Not maybe so, or think so, or feel so, or kind of so, but no-so. 
And to say, I know that I'm saved and I know that I'm going to heaven, that's not arrogance. Maybe someone could accuse us of arrogance and how can you possibly say, I know that I'm going to heaven. You're bragging now. No, we're not bragging on ourselves. We're bragging on Jesus who gives us this eternal life. If there's anything good in you, if there's anything good in me, it is all by His grace and what Christ has done for us. So, today we're going to talk about knowing salvation in Jesus Christ, living in this absolute certainty. It's very important as you come to the Lord's table today and break bread and drink of the cup. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, let every person examine himself and then eat of this bread and drink of this cup. Before you eat the bread and drink the cup, you're to take an inward look and to know that Christ lives in you. He goes on in this same passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, to give a stern warning about taking of the supper unworthily or in an unworthily matter. And I view that as just going through the motions, just a ritual, just a thing you do when the church decides to do it. No, let every person have a time of personal examination today, and in particular, your relationship to God through Jesus Christ. Paul added on to this same theme of testing or examination in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Look at this verse. We're putting it on the screen. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test guarantees that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail to meet the test. So there's a test. There's a test at the table today. I don't know about you, but I never really enjoyed those pop quizzes in class. It really exposed where you were on the knowledge of the information you were supposed to be studying. And so those pop quizzes, those tests. So uh, this is a test today. For some of you, it's, it's a pop quiz. You haven't thought about this in a while. It's an examination, and it is a personal and prayerful examination. And it begins with this question, am I saved? Do I know Christ? You say, well, can you know? 1 John 5.13 is our text for today to start. It says, I write these things to you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know, K-N-O-W, know that you have, present tense, that you have eternal life. Now, this little letter of 1 John, you know, John the Apostle is the author, human author, of uh, this book of 1 John, a letter, an epistle, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Also, the book of Revelation was given uh, to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. He's also the author of the Gospel of John. So, this one whom Jesus loved very much and intimate among the disciples, Peter, James, and John. John uh, was one of the fishermen that Christ called, and he was known as the Son of Thunder, and Christ changed his life and channeled all of that thunder in his soul to being a powerful witness of the gospel and a writer of five New Testament books. And it is John who's saying that I write these things to you that you may know. Thirty-nine times either the word know or to know or to acknowledge is in the little book of 1 John. I often advise new Christians to read 1 John. If you are a relatively new believer, uh, read 1 John because 1 John will bring you the assurance that you need as you're just getting started. Or if you're doubting your salvation, if you're wondering whether you're on your way to heaven, read 1 John because as we're going to see in just a moment, there are the guarantees, the evidences of a genuine faith in 1 John. Near the end of his earthly life, the Apostle Paul said these words, but I am not ashamed For I know whom I believed and am convinced that he is able to guard that until until that day what he has entrusted to me. I memorized it in the King James. I say it again. I'm not ashamed, for I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What day? 
the day we stand in the presence of God, the day we have final exams in the presence of God. And I am persuaded with, with Paul that I will be there because Christ will keep what I have given to him. John, well, Jesus himself echoes these words. John 5, 24. John 5, 24. This is a verse you should know. Mark, memorize in your Bible. It is veritably your spiritual birth certificate. Are you ready for it? We'll put it on the screen. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes on him who sent me has. What's the tense of that verb? Present tense. Has it right now. Eternal life does not begin when we die. It begins the moment we receive the life of Christ. Now, we are in process. It will be fulfilled in the presence of God when we go to heaven. But we have this eternal life right now. And he does not come into judgment, but has, again, press tense, passed from death into life. What security, what strength there is in this. And John the Apostle adds to this word in John 5 and verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has, notice the tense again, has been born of God. You're going to see in 1 John the words born or born of or begotten of God. Jesus spoke of the new birth. He said, you must be born again. So we are alive in Christ. He said, he, everyone who believes that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever who has been born of him. Verse 11. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So what we have in 1 John are marks of the Christian. What marks us as believers? What are the evidences? What are the assurances that we have that we are in Christ? We've called these the birthmarks of the believer. When you are born again, these birthmarks identify you as a Christian. What is the evidence in my life, in your life, that we do know the Lord? I'm going to mention several today in the next 12 minutes, so listen, listen carefully. Number one, number one, a Christ-filled life. You have a Christ-filled life. This is the very beginning. To be a believer is to believe. To believe what? To believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. To believe that He died and rose again and gives eternal life to all who believes. The simple question is, what must I do to be saved? It was asked by a jailer in Philippi, and the answer came as clear as possible. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Believe is to commit your life to Christ and confess Him as your Lord and Savior. So this is where it begins. It begins with a birth. You are not saved because you grow up in church. You are not saved because your family is a Christian family and you have the legacy of a Christian home. You are not saved because you are baptized. You are not saved because you receive the Lord's Supper from time to time or every week or every day as far as that goes. You are saved when you personally and decisively believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Receiving Him as your Savior and following Him as your Lord. He who has the Son, Jesus, has life because Christ is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, said Christ. The Apostle Peter would later say there's no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. No other way to be saved apart from Jesus. He's not a way. He's the way. He's not one of the ways. He's the way to eternal life. So you pray and invite Christ into your life. John 10, or Romans 10 rather, says if we confess with our mouths, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So there is a beginning, a new beginning, a new birth. It is a simple faith. But in today's culture, 
in today's church, there are many who have never made this declaration, including preachers in pulpits. They don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Both preachers and church members across this country are living in doubts and fears and in error because the ultimate and the eternal confession of the Christian is about Jesus, the Savior. Christianity is not a code, it's not a cause, it's not a creed, it's not a church. It is Christ and Christ alone. 1 John 4, let me put these verses up. You're in 1 John, you just turn back and look at them yourselves. It, just speaking of those who deny Christ. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Who is a false prophet? By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you've heard was coming and is now in the world already. So the spirit of the Antichrist is in the culture, it's in the world, it's also in the church today. So I don't assume anything regarding people who grow up in church or in churches. You never hear the gospel. You've never responded personally to faith in Christ. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Could it be more clear? Christ-filled life. So I ask you today, do you know that you're a Christian? If your answer to that question starts with, yes, because I, because I, I'm living a good life, because I am a Baptist, because I am a Catholic, because I'm trying, because I'm a good family man, because I'm a good person. If your answer to the question, do you know you're saved? Yes, and it's the answer, yes, because I, you've missed the whole thing. Because salvation is not about me, you, or my. If you're thinking, I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my ship, this is all on me, it's about my character, it's about my goodness, my human goodness, no. Most people need to repent of their human goodness because the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags before a holy God. We don't always feel saved. When you're tired or when you're guilty or when you're discouraged, you may not feel the Spirit. You may not feel like you're going to heaven. God may seem far away at times. But God does not depend upon your feelings. I mean, you get up these days like some of us do, fighting raging uh, mountain cedar, you may not feel all that saved. But salvation does not depend on how we feel, but upon what Christ has done for us. It's what we remember again and again at the Lord's table, His blood, His body that he has finished the work that he came to do. And in addition to the Word of God, these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life, is the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 16 says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You say, what is the witness of the Spirit? I can't describe it to you, but there is a sense because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we know, that we know, that we know, that we know that we're saved. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Assurance is not about what I have done. It is not about us. It is all because of Jesus and His cross and His resurrection. How wonderful just to trust in Jesus and rest in His promise to pardon us and the peace that He provides when we know Him. So the first mark, believer's birthmark, is that of a 
Christ-filled life? Is Christ in your life? Is the Spirit of God bearing witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? But there's a second mark that I want to mention briefly here, and that is continuous joy. Continuous joy. Uh, you're in 1 John. Go back to 1 John chapter 1 and look at the fourth verse. John says, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Continuous joy. He speaks of our fellowship with Christ. And John was saying, we walked with him, we talked with him, and we want you to know him so that our joy in Christ will be complete. There is in this certainty a continuous, are you listening? In this certainty, there is a continuous, conspicuous, contagious joy in Jesus Christ. You said just a moment ago, Pastor, it wasn't about your feelings. I didn't say feeling joy. I don't always feel happy. I don't always feel joy. But deep within, there is joy in my heart because of Jesus that is not dependent upon my feelings, not dependent upon our circumstances, but it is joy that is given in Christ. I mean, just to begin with the fact, Jesus said, rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. Just start there and spend eternity filled with joy, thanking God for His salvation uh, in Christ. Psalm 16, verse 11, the verse that I love, it says, In your presence, O Lord, is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So when Christ lives in you, there is this abiding joy. As a young person, as a teenager, it's great to hear all the teenagers. We heard you, and we're praying for freedom. Uh, when I was a teenager, uh, someone wrote in my Bible, joy is the flag that flies high in the heart when the king is in residence there. Uh, I'm told that in Buckingham Palace, when the queen or the king now is in residence, they fly the flag. When King Jesus is in residence in your life, when he is reigning in your life, then that joy flag is flying high. Secondly, not only a Christ-filled life and continuous joy, but thirdly, a changed life. First John, or changed behavior. First John 2, 29, if you know that He is righteous, speaking of Christ, you may be sure, there's our word again, certainty, assurance, that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. In other words, we're not saved by good works, but we live in these good works, for we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But then we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So what happens when Christ comes to live in us that our lives change? He changes the way we think. That's the very word repentance is to change your mind or to change the way you think. So when Christ lives in us, our, our belief produces a behavior that is transformed by the presence of Christ. And therefore, He changes the way we think. He changes the way we act. He changes the way we speak, the words that we use, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone be in Christ, He's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Everything becomes new. And as we learn and live our faith, we grow in Christ's likeness. The Spirit of God will see to it. The Word of God will feed you and grow you into godliness. And our habits and our attitudes and our actions are changed. We are no longer the same person. It's like the fellow said, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I'm going to be. But thank God I'm not what I was. Christ changes our lives. And this is evidence. Someone asked the question, if you were convicted or arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? What's the evidence that Christ lives in your life? And then next, there is compassionate love. 1 John 4, 7, this is another birthmark of the believer. Beloved, let us love one another, for to love is from God, and whoever loves has been, here's our phrase again, born of God. 
Whoever loves has the love of God in him and knows God. How do you know you're a Christian? Love. Love for God. And because you love God, you love the brothers. You see, when, when I became a Christian, I wanted to be right with the Father, and I wanted to be right with my brother and sister in Christ. And so we have a family of faith, and we love one another. We are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. And how can you say you love the groom, Jesus, if you don't love his bride? So a mark according to the scriptures, that you are saved is that you love the brothers and sisters in Christ. You have this continuous joy, this Christ-filled life. You have a changed life, and you have Christian love. Jesus said to his disciples, by this shall all people know that you are my disciple, that you, what? Love one another. In a sense, surrounding this table today, passing these elements, even though it's a, it's a large feast that we're having today, we are surrounded by family. The greatest joys of my life come when our family gathers around our table, our children and our grandchildren, Dev and myself, and, and we are our family. We're not perfect by any means, but we're family. We love one another. We pray for one another. And in the church, this is a family. This is not uh, a professional organization. This is the body of Christ. This is the family of God. The church is not something you join. It's something you're a part of. Your life is in it. Your love is in it. And don't tell me that you're saved, that you know Christ and you're going to heaven, but you spend hardly an hour every month or so with the family of God in church. We have people who never attend church. Never even think about it. It's not even on your schedule in any way. How can you say, I know and love Jesus, and according to the Scripture, not love the brothers and sisters in Christ? I want to challenge you to faithfulness in the family of God. Be in a small group where you can get to know people. Be in a life group where you can study God's Word with other Christians. Be in a support group, a family group, be in a choir, a worship group, be in a mission or group, be with other believers, be in church on Sunday morning. We love the church because we are family. I know we got some crazy uncles in the crowd. I mean, wasn't it good to see brothers and sisters and grandfather and grandson baptized. I mean, that's beautiful. We all cheered because that's family. They're family. But look, listen, yes, it's true. It's wonderful to see a husband and wife, but there is a sense in which in Christ we are a family just like that. In fact, my brothers and sisters in Christ are closer to someone in my family who may not be a follower in Christ. Then there's conquering faith. I only mention this because we're going to move to the Lord's Supper, but 1 John 5, 4 says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So there is a conquering faith in that when we are Christians, when we decide to follow Jesus and determine that we will live differently in the world, we're going to find opposition. There will be resistance. There is the world. There is the flesh. There is the devil. But how can we live in this victory? Our victory is in faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory. And then one final thing. Okay, guys, just I'm going to let you all get situated here. You jumped the gun just a little bit, man. (laughs) But I'm glad you're ready to go. We'll fix that in the second service. I want you to, sincerely, I want you to really heads up and listen to this. There is confident prayer. 1 John 5, 14 to 15 says, and this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that if He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. You know how you can know you're saved? Continuing prayer. 
confident prayer. Because if you're not praying, everything else is just religious talk. If you're not communicating with God and asking God and receiving from Him what He has promised you, then you are missing this mark. So before we pass these elements, would you just bow your heads with me and close your eyes, everyone praying? And let's review. Are you saved? The Scripture says, let everyone examine himself. Are you saved? Say, how can I know? Is Christ living in in you? Do you have a Christ-filled life? Has there been a moment, a miracle in your life when you have received Christ as Savior? You say, well, I don't don't really know. I don't remember the time or day. You don't have to remember the day. Have you ever heard that? Somebody says, if you can't remember the time or the day to the place that you received Christ, then you're not saved. I don't believe that. It's not about what happened years ago. It's good to have a time. It's good to have a date. It's good to have a place. I do. But the real question is, are you saved today? This is all present tense. So don't don't fret about whatever may have happened years ago. I'm asking you today, is Christ alive in you? Is Jesus in you watching online? And then do you have this continuous joy in Jesus? Because you have fellowship with him. You're walking with him. Jesus said, my joy I give to you. And then a changed behavior. Has Christ changed your life? Are you just the same old you? Just a better invention of you? Or you're the master of your faith? You're doing your... No, Jesus changes your life. Has he changed your life? Are you a new person? Has he changed your heart? Do you have a conquering faith? Victory in Jesus. And are you confident that when you pray, as Christ promised, that he will hear you and answer your prayers according to his will? And do you have a compassionate love for the family of God, the people of God. And do you love the people that God loves? And God loves the world. It's the mark of the Christian. So let every person examine themselves to see if they be in the faith. If you've never received Christ, do it right now. Before you touch these elements, just invite Christ into your life. Say, Lord, I do trust you as my Lord and my Savior. And I ask you to help me to know now and forever that I belong to you because I believe in you and because of what you have done for me. Just call upon the name of the Lord. Settle it today. If you're not settled in this, settle it right now. You don't have to walk out of here wondering. You should not be a question mark. You should be a walking exclamation point. I am saved by the power of of Christ, by the blood of Christ who washes away our sins. And if you're saying that, trust Him as your Savior now. Confess Him as your Lord and follow Him as your Lord and Savior today. Lord, as we receive these elements, your body, the bread, your blood, the cup, may we do it as saved people, saved and secure in you. May we do it worthily, not because we are worthy, but because you are worthy. And because your blood and your body given for us has made us your children, we are born again into a living hope. In Jesus' name, amen. When you receive the elements as they're passed, just hold on to them, and we'll eat and drink at the same time.
that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen So as the scripture says, let every person examine their own hearts. If there is a need for repentance in your life, repent of sin. This same 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's power in the blood and in the body of our Lord given to us. So be cleansed in Christ. Be changed by the power of the resurrection. And before you taste of this bread and drink of this cup, settle it in your heart that you know, that you know that you are born of God, that you are a child of God in the family of God. So on the same night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it, unleavened bread, pure. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. a new chalice today. I brought it from 
the garden tomb in Jerusalem. It's carved in olive wood and it's just a chalice. It's nothing magical about it. But it does speak to me of the resurrection. And it is the resurrection of the body and the life of God that makes salvation possible. So when we bring up blood, the blood of Christ symbolized in this cup and in the drink within this cup, the Bible says there's life in the blood. If you go to the doctor for an examination, they most likely are going to take your blood because your blood says so much about you and what's going on inside of you. Life is in the blood. Life in Christ is in the blood. It's the blood of Christ cleansing you from sin. Trust Him to do it. And on that night, He took the cup, which was red with the fruit of the vine, and He says, this is the new covenant, the promise of my blood, which is given for you as often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. Would you stand with me, please? Everyone standing together. We're thankful for this wonderful salvation. Now I'm going to ask you to do something publicly to follow Christ. I'm going to ask that you come forward. There are pastors in the balcony, in the Landing, there are men right here, our pastors who are here to receive all who will come forward and receive Christ as Savior. And I'm going to ask you to do it today. Today's the day of salvation. You pray, you settle it. You say, well, I, I want to settle it. I want to know. Come, don't leave this building without knowing that Christ is living in you, that you have this living hope, that you're forgiven that you're going to heaven, that you know where you are going, and then to take as many people with you as possible as witnesses of Christ. So I'm going to ask you to come forward and to confess your faith. We're not going to ask that you make a speech or we're not going to make a spectacle out of you in any way, but the act of coming forward will be a clear, definitive, decisive moment in your life. There's something about coming forward and openly confessing Christ that seals it and settles it and secures it in your life. I know it blesses the church and shames the devil when a person comes forward to receive Christ. So come today. We talked about the church being a place where we're brothers and sisters, family of God. Are you active in serving the Lord in the church? If Christ is leading you, if the Holy Spirit is prompting you to join Preston Wood, come forward today. Make this your church home. A church where you can grow and serve and share your faith and pray and minister and be ministered to. Come and join the church today. Some of you planned on it before you even got here. Good, lead the way. Others, you're convinced that this is the time you need to make that move. If you want to rededicate your life to Christ today, if you prayed in your heart and you renewed your faith today, you want to make that public or you need prayer, come forward, let us pray for you and let us encourage you. The Christian life is a series of new beginnings. So make this a new beginning in your life today. Lord, take now this time of decision. For those watching online and those right here in this room, may they do right now, today, what they will be so glad they've done when they stand before you in eternity. Help us to know that we're saved, God, and that we are as sure for heaven as if we were already there. In Jesus' name, amen and 